Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Music Matters Academy. Uh, Jasper Donut here, the CEO of Branded. Um, Music Matters Academy, a series of virtual events designed to help build a foundation for musicians and their management and next-gen business leaders from the music industry wanting to learn and upskill through the mentorship and knowledge uh, sharing of some global industry icons. Um, it is the business of music taught here by the music business. Um, our first six, maybe seven modules have covered publishing, digital platforms, getting noticed, artist management, production, and the crazy world of NFTs. And this morning, brilliant session on synchronization and how to get your music heard and into games and films and TV and, and advertising. Um, the content so far has been watched by over 70,000 people, which is brilliant. Um, and we're very, very proud of this. Um, and for any of you that was there, we were live IRL uh, in person in Singapore last November. Seems like a year, an age ago. Um, the content is virtual. The content is live and it's fireside. Uh, but we want to make it as interactive as possible. We had some brilliant questions this morning. Please do ask questions. Uh, get them in the chat box. Uh, they'll be fed to me and I, I will then in turn ask the speakers. Um, there is also, as ever, uh, a small private meet and greet after this. Um, it's on the uh, musicmatters.academy website. Uh, you need to just click into it and register. It's it's limited in numbers and sometimes the best content of all because people get to ask very, very personal questions. Um, but but it's I believe it's close to full, so you need to sign up. Um, this afternoon, we are talking about something that's very, very, very close to Branded's heart. Talk about brands. Um, it's brands, it's bands, and it's fans. In a minute, I'm going to introduce you to four absolutely fantastic speakers. Uh, but before that, um, I'm going to say, I say this a lot. You'll have noticed that the Music Masters Academy is free. Um, and so we need to thank our partners for making that, making that possible. Um, I'd like to thank YouTube. I'd like to thank Believe. Um, plus the support of Eureka, Dolby, and Steinberg Protocol. Now, somewhere we have uh, someone's microphone making a bit of noise in the in the in the background there. Um, but um, uh, so so uh, hopefully the production team will be able to to take care of that. Anyway, everyone in the internet world, thank you for joining. It's lovely to see you again. Uh, please enjoy. Please learn. And as I say, please do get your questions in, and I'll make sure that they're they're. they're presented to the to the speakers um on with the show let's meet all of our wonderful four speakers we're exploring the relationship between artist and brand how they all work together or not uh, we want to paint a picture of what is available to artists in terms of the kinds of partnerships out there and what they need to do to enjoy them plus we want to get an understanding of how artists or artists can market themselves and that how do you get hold of a brand um, we have four great speakers. Two of them are from the buy side, i.e. their clients, uh, which means we have to be really nice to them. And two of them are from the sell side, so they're the, uh, they're the content owners. Uh, on the buy side, we have Eli from Vans. He's the, the, the uh, marketing director of Vans in Asia Pacific. We have uh, Danielle from Fuse uh, Entertainment in London. Um, so thank you for joining in this morning, Danielle. And on the sell side, we have... Uh, from, from Google, we have Rushit, um, uh, so he's the digital platform, uh, and he's going to be talking more about YouTube and their relationship with, with brands and, and, and music. And from Universal Music, we have the label uh, represented by Janice, uh, who is uh, in, in Singapore with us. So, so thank you to the four of you. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to meet each of them one by one, ask them a couple of questions so, they, so we get to know them, and then we'll bring them all back for a, for a panel discussion. And again, please do... Get your uh, get your questions in. It's very good to see Olivier Robert Murphy has joined somewhere <laughs> in the world, the global head of all things brands from Universal Music. So Janice, no pressure. No pressure. Um, <laughs> there's no pressure at all. Now we're going to start with Eli. We're going to start with the client, um, and then, as I said, we will bring we will bring the uh, the others back. So one of those, so Nips, Mr. Producer, one of those three had a very noisy microphone. If we can try and work that out backstage. Anyway, Eli. Welcome to the Music Matters Academy. The last time we saw you, you were speaking at the Sports Matters Academy. So thank you. Sorry, at Sports Matters itself. 
So thank you very much for joining. Please give us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where are you? Uh, what do your family think you do for a living? It's a good question for the last one. Uh, well, thank you. It's great to be here uh, and to share a you know a virtual stage with you again, Jasper. Uh, my name's Eli, Elijah, whatever works for you. Uh, I represent Vans. I oversee Vans marketing for Asia, North and South Asia. The only country that I don't represent is China. And it's a pretty big one, but uh, we look at it kind of in a different cadence. Uh, with that, what do we do? Um, it, you know, it's such a good question because to your point, I was with you when we were talking about sports and skate specifically with some pretty amazing guests, and now we're talking about music. Um, for, for a brand like Vans and, and what I do and our teams do is really try to continually engage. And that's a very vague term, but I probably could have given you a, a lot more of a direct answer two years ago about what we do and how we do it and how we approach it and what the perspective is. And kind of as we're, we're, where we are right now is we're really using this time as a brand that's rooted in skateboarding and surf and, and snow and art and music and street culture and all the things that are within that street culture. And we just happen to have hundreds of retail doors you know, across the region of how we're resetting everything that we've known and done now and re-engaging with um, our partners, re-engaging with our, our, our um, consumers. Um, so, you know, to a degree, that, that's really what we're doing. We're talking about it. And as we talk about it, we're rolling these things out. And um, some of them are kind of scary uh, and some of them are pretty darn exciting. So that's the, some of the stuff that I'm hoping that we can dig into a little bit today. Um, our team here in Singapore uh, represents the whole region. Um, we're scaled out pretty big in Korea, so you probably see some big things that we're doing up there. But I love to see that as a, as a brand throughout Asia and Asia Pacific, we kind of have that consistency and that red thread that runs through everything we do, from user-generated content pieces to how we elevate athletes and to really how we roll out our stores and that experience, hopefully, that our, our friends and families and consumers have when they go to our stores or our partner doors or the skate shops or a skate park or an event. Um, and that's really what we strive to uh, to maintain. So in a, in, a, in a short nutshell, that's what we do. And what, what an amazing job. And you, you must have a lot of a lot of, f of fun with the job. Now, we're, we're talking about music specifically today. And, and, and Vans, I, I, know, I know you said you're replanning things at the moment. But Vans is synonymous as a brand is synonymous with music as well as other sporting ventures. But things like the Warped Tour and what have you. Can, can you just give us a little bit of a background as to how Vans has worked with music and musicians in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what still amazes me, we, we had actually a meeting today, a, a, a town hall, as they call it, with all the van staff across Asia. And a surprise to us was Steve Van Doren, um, whose father was Paul Van Doren, the founder of the company. So Steve's what everybody knows. And you look up, you see Steve Van Doren, it's him. And we always get these anecdotes every time that he comes up. And again, with the whole Asia region, he was sharing these stories. And it kind of reflects really back into the 60s of how organic things were and why, how this basic shoe company was able to reach out and extend into areas like skateboarding as well as music. Um, and it really was born primarily out of skateboarding because within skateboarding, you had these kids who were in bands back then who happened to also skate and like the shoes and they'd have skate sessions and they'd play music and that just built out from there. Um, it was really more of a, of a, of a partnership with the individuals who were engaging in music, creating music. And we were there to really help them and support them on their journey, never to own it, but to help them wave their flag. It's interesting that you bring up Warp Tour. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. Warp Tour ran for 24 years. Um, and it truly was a, it was a, it was a passion project. It was a, it was a project of love. It was not a commercial endeavor. As a matter of fact, I think they, quote unquote, wrote it off. They had to because they lost money every year on it. But between Steve and a few other key individuals for those years, they, I mean, if, you, if, you, if any of you have ever been to a Warped Tour, and I hope you had the opportunity to, it truly was a band of misfits. And it went from a small kind of circus kind of thing when it first started to what it ended up in 24 years where there's five stages, 50 acts, uh, you know, a whole tent village of people. And you get the oddballs and the squares and everybody in between. And it truly was a great delivery of the kind of people that 
kind of come together and celebrate music on this crazy thing called Warp Tour. Uh, they had to end it, unfortunately, just because, again, I think like everything else, they kind of nodded their heads and agreed it had, it had run its course and it's time to start something fresh. Um, but I really look at that as one of the pinnacles of how as a non-commercial, like, we don't create music, we provide a platform. And how a platform like that can still continue to reach out and engage people within the music community. And by being able to reach out and engage people in the music community, then we have further the opportunity to work with amazing partners like Universal, work with companies like Spotify, work with companies like Apple in a truly non-commercial way, truly in a way to build and to help our stakeholders being the musicians and our customers and all those people to reach out and continue to help elevate them as a community. So that's, uh, yeah, the short of it. Brilliant. I mean, the, the, the Warp Tour was always the, it was the, the, the it, you know, the idea, the idea of just jumping on a bus and going city to city around the States, turning up in a city, out comes a stage, play, get back on the bus with all your mates, go to the next city. So, so Eli, thank you again for joining us. But we're going we're gonna to come back to you and we're going to find out more about how uh, brands, sorry, how artists can work with a brand like, like Vans or, or what, as a marketing person, what advice you could give to a musician who wants to work with a brand. Sometimes musicians are great for brands sometimes they're not um it used to be seen as selling out now it's seen as very much a a, a, a very important part of, a, of an artist relationship so so but we're going to come back to you on on some questions like that so thank you eli you're going to be whisked into the back room and we're going to now we're going to uh, meet janice from universal music hey janice how are you i've already i've already blown your cover that you're in you're in singapore but tell us, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what is your role at universal music Right. Um, I'm, I'm Janice. I am the Southeast Asia and Korea Senior Regional Director for Universal Music Group for Brands. Um, we are a division in Universal Music um, that actually brings in all the activities and revenues for the non-recorded income side of the business. So that includes brand partnership revenues from sponsorships, endorsements, even sync and all those branded artist fan experiences. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll also answer that question in the context of this afternoon session. It's about brands, bands, and fans. So what I do for brands, um, when brands come to us in Universal Music, we help them with the matchmaking process with the artist. Um, we also help them design the right activations um, to run whenever they intend to do activations in music or whenever they engage an artist for their campaigns. And we make sure that those activations resonate well with their audience. Um, we also work with brands to make sure that whatever it is that they invest in music and in our artists, it's fully optimized and it would really stick with the customers. Um, so that's on the brand side. Then we move to the bands, like what's our role? For the artists, um, we help them work with brands or products or connect them with brands that they feel passionate about. Um, we also help the artist connect with a broader range of fan base because that's what brands do. They really bring you to, um, you know, to the ears and eyes of their customers. And that's really very helpful for an artist's career. And also, obviously, it, it generates the non-recorded income side for the artist. And then for the fans, um, my work is very exciting because it actually brings the fans closer to the artist and it gives them a very different experience of the artist. It gives them a different view of who the artist is. It gives them the more personal side or the more private side of the artist if the artist allows it. Um, and so overall, that's that's what we do. We, we help brands. Um, we help the artists and we also give new experiences to fans. Uh, brilliant. So, so, so final question to you is, is what, what, can you, can you list any, any artists or brands that you, that you're currently working with or have worked with? Whew. Where to start with that list? We have like, it, it's, that's the good thing about working in universal music. Uh, like we have a fantastic roster of international artists um like my six-year-old nephew actually thinks i sit in the same office as justin bieber 
and in BTS. Yeah, you do, don't you? <laughs> you don't? Yeah, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm cool on DJs. Um, but aside from that, I think what's what's great also is in Southeast Asia, we have over a uh, over 100 um, domestic artists signed to the label now. Um, like in Singapore, we have Young Raja, Faris Jaba. Um, in, in, in Malaysia, we have Joe Flizzo. Um, we have D Diana Danielle. We have this new girl group called Dala. Um, I, I can go on and on and give you the names of all the artists so that, that are under Universal Music, but that's to me is what makes my job really exciting and also very easy. It's because I have you know access to this really wonderful roster of talents. Brilliant. So so we, we, when we come back, we're going to be talking to you know talking to all four of you. But we're, it's going to be very interesting to understand your thoughts on you know examples of brands and artist relationships that have worked and why. But also we're going to be looking at things like what, what happens when it goes wrong or what a what a common rookie errors that artists make when trying to to work with a brand you know think i'm just gonna i'm just gonna phone coca-cola and be in their commercial um so um thank you very much for that um yeah. next up we have danielle now people in the world wide web please don't forget to get your uh questions in to us um uh, and we will pass them on but danielle um fuse entertainment tell me a little tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us where you are who you are, what you do for a living, and what's your relationship with, with the music business and brands? Sure. Um, so, yes, I work at Fuse. We're a sports and entertainment marketing agency. Um, our head office is in London, but we've got offices all over the world, and we're part of Omnicom Media Group. Um, so I, um, my background's music, which I can sort of go and touch on briefly, but I head up the entertainment team. So we work primarily on music and gaming marketing partnership campaigns with pre pretty much major global brands. We work with the likes of Pepsi, Lay's, McDonald's, we work with Vodafone. Um, and we work on a lot of convergence culture um, projects. So a lot of times we're working on the intersection of sports and music, which is our two sort of core pillars. Um, but yeah, my background, um, I started in the music industry. So when I was at uh, university, um, I actually used to work for Universal. They used to have college scouts that did a and r and um, local promotions on campus and in the city. So um, I did that for a couple of years. And then I got on the Warner Graduate Scheme, which I, I, unfortunately they don't run anymore, but it was actually a really good program. And um, moved on to running their street team back before social media, all the grassroots marketing campaigns. And worked on the likes of um, Green Day, 50 Cent. Um, uh, but yeah, um, after that, I worked at a rock label called Roadrunner for about seven years. Um, it was owned by Universal at the time, but then um, it was bought by Warner. But actually, during that time, I worked um, with a lot of rock and alternative bands that sort of needed that extra support and started doing brand partnerships just to help with the marketing budgets because they're you know, traditionally artists that don't get as much exposure in radio and traditional sort of media outlets. Um, and then um, I moved to AEG and I worked at the O2, running O2's partnership. Um, obviously, O2 are huge in music, amazing clients. And then I moved on to um, Fuse, where I am now. So I guess when I was leaving the music industry in terms of the label side, it was before Spotify really kicked in. So I wanted to get into sort of doing talent deals, still working in music, but working on sort of big global brand partnership campaigns. And um, that's what I'm doing now. Brilliant. And, and, and Daniel, can you get, give us an example of some of the clients that you work with? Because you, you work for the clients and then you, you take them to content owners, right? So, so can you give us an example of some of the clients and maybe even some of the projects you work on? Yeah, sure. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, one of our big clients is PepsiCo. Um, so we work with Pepsi actually on the Champions League final opening ceremony and working in another big sporting opening ceremony this year. I, I can't see it because it's confidential, um, but we work also with PepsiCo on Lay's. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we work with clients like McDonald's. A lot of clients we work more on the music festival side, so it's not all talent led partnerships. Um, and we work with Vodafone sort of on both. Um, as well as in the sports side, um, they've just announced a Wimbledon partnership, which is super exciting. Um, 
but so yeah, it's pretty much brands that, that you would have heard of, big global brands. And and do you ever work, do you ever represent artists? Do you ever get on the sales side? Um, we don't do sales. What we'll do is sort of similar um, to what was mentioned earlier from Janice, we'll work with clients from the strategic side, sort of through to identifying talent, um, making that match um, through to sort of act the strategy for content, running out the campaign. And if they do events, we, we do brand experiences as well. So it is an end to end solution for partnerships. Brilliant. OK, so um, when when you come back, we're going to be asking you many questions. But I think I think understanding what can an artist do to work with an agency to help them uh, work with brands and what have you would be uh, a core a core question we'll come back to you for. So, so Danielle, thank you for joining us from London. We're going to you're going to come back in a minute. Uh, the final introduction is to uh, to Rushit from Google. Hey, Rushit, I think I think most people who are watching today will have heard of Google. Uh, what 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 is your what is your role? What do you and, and how do you interact with brands and and ent the entertainment business? Awesome. Hey, Jasper, thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, you're right. Most people would have heard of Google. I, I do spend a lot of time working on YouTube. Uh, my role is to bridge the gap between content creators and brand partners. Uh, I've been in the content business for a long time, back from the TV days. So I used to be like the digital guy in TV, and now I'm the TV guy in digital. Uh, and what we do at Google is, of course, I look, I look at all content categories across YouTube, but music definitely takes up uh, a massive chunk of that, simply because we get 2 billion, you know, 2 billion people log, log in daily to watch a music video on YouTube. Uh, and that's a massive number. So YouTube is a, is the destination to watch music. And what we try to do is work with brand partners to ensure that they can get access to that inventory, get access to that content. Um, and we have various ways of working with them. It could be through content lineups, which is which are curated for brands, uh, or it could be working with artists and creating collaboration opportunities for brands to partner with those artists as well. And we've also, in fact, we've just launched some shows. So we've got YouTube Music Nights, which we've launched in the Philippines and Indonesia and in Thailand, uh, where we do performances and we bring in uh, some big artists along with emerging artists to perform on stage for a special night on YouTube. And and you, and you work with brands on those on those uh, on those initiatives, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we we've built these content properties, and most of them are brand funded. So we would work with advertisers. Uh, to make sure and our content partners to make sure that brands are integrated within that messaging uh and you know artists get a, a new platform to showcase their skills fantastic well um we can find we're going to find out more about that when we, we we're now going to bring everyone back together um uh, so we can we can ask a few more questions uh hopefully there'll be some more questions coming from the uh from the world wide web uh, we have one from uh, Aaron, and Aaron, if I get your surname wrong, I do apologize, but Arun Ramanathan, um, with uh, what have been the most effective strategies when it comes to raising the profile of Asia, of artists in Asia to the West? So maybe that should go to Janice first. So what have been the most effective strategies when it comes to raising the profile of artists in Asia, so Asian artists to the West, I guess? Um, thanks for that question, Arun. Um, I I wouldn't say there's there's only one effective strategy to be able to do that, but what I've seen from one of the Southeast Asia artists, um, this guy called Zach Tabudlo in the Philippines. I remember myself watching our New Year's Eve uh, program in the Philippines last year with my family, and I, I was the only one excited about Zach. None of them knew who he was. Um, but we we did a sync deal in the Philippines for one of Zach Tabudlo's singles, and that propelled him to become viral in the Philippines almost overnight. Um, and that was a sync for a digital series in, in, in the Philippines. And and Zach is, I think Rushit can also attest to how big Zach is now. Like he's really very popular. He's released so many um, hit singles since since um, uh, his since one year ago, and he's even reached um, the he's even had a billboard in New York Times Square. So from someone who was almost obscure, like less than 
12 months ago to someone who has, you know, who has a billboard in, in New York Times Square. That That is, you know, a really great success story for Zach. And we can say that that was coming from a sync deal that we did for him. So we do sync deals from the label side also as a marketing, um, you know, activity for, for our artists and to help them promote their tracks. But, you know, it, it's just one of it's just one of the strategies. I'm not going to say that, you know, if, if you want to go big and you want to cross over from Asia to the West, that you have to do a sync deal. But it's it, that's what I've seen that has worked so far. Um, so I'm going to ask the same question to Danielle, because Danielle is technically in the West. <laughs> um, so coming from the East to the West, Danielle, um, any advice you can give for raising profile of artists uh, in, in the West? It's not technically in line with this session, but it's still, it's still mm. a good question. I think um, I would say the artists really need to get familiar with TikTok. I'm, I love TikTok. I don't create TikToks, I'm more of a voyeur, but um, you know, you've seen people like Emmy Melly with I Am Women um, and Gail with that A, B, C, D, E, F, U track. Um, you know, if, the great thing that I love about TikTok is it's an even playing field. Um, as long as your content's good, people will get served it if it's sort of relevant to them. So I really recommend like new artists to really get familiar with the platform and they use it as a way, you know, try and start a trend or get your friends to be posting videos with it. it like the opportunities are quite limitless on it. And we've seen, as I said, with those two examples, how it can actually break artists. Great. So, so thank you for that question, Arun. Um, Eli, I'm going to come back to you here. Um, now I know that you're you're not necessarily doing you know like you said the warp tour isn't on anymore and stuff but but as a brand as a marketer what what advice could you give an artist who wants to work with a brand like Vans or a brand in, in, at all what what advice would you give them because they're not just going to call you and say hey can you sponsor me or could or could they um, you know again as, as a brand that is more focused or no I shouldn't say more focused that is focused on selling footwear and apparel. Uh, we we don't deal in music, so it's it's it is a, it's a strange balance of where where do we play our part? Um, I think there's a couple direct applications though to answer your question. One of the first ones that we really look at is we have we keep referring to in the market UGC user generated content platforms, and we really try to align one with each of our true pillars of our brand, and music is one of our pillars. So for that, particularly specifically to Asia, about five years, five, six, it's 2020, right? It's just kidding, just kidding. Uh, we're, we're kind of going back about for seven years ago, seven years ago, we started a platform called Musicians Wanted. It was specific to Asia because we felt we needed a better soapbox, for better words, to provide to our fans, the people who like the brand, people who are drawn to the brand. But we wanted to do it in a way that wasn't like your proverbial battle of the bands. We really wanted to give a platform to anybody who sings in the shower, plays a violin, like it didn't matter what you did. And with this platform, basically, you could do your content. Of course, there were certain rules and stipulations and whatnot, but you could upload your content onto the, the regional platform. And from there, it became live to be judged on by your peers or by anybody who was out there. So you almost in a weird way could become your own marketer to reach out to your friends and say like, yo, I just submitted my stuff on the advanced missions wanted, like go out there and give me some likes because whoever gets the most likes goes into this next phase. So it was kind of like, yeah, put your stuff up there and you could be really good. But like everything else, you know, the tree falls in the woods if no one heard it, they didn't really fall, create some noise around it. Um, long story short, over the past, I'd say over the, over the five or six years we've been running it, we went from year one where it was relatively new and fresh to having a few thousand submissions across the region to even recently last year in a pandemic state where we couldn't bring it to a true live stage in a house of vans or south by southwest or whatever they may be and we still had i'm forgetting the number but tens of thousands of submissions so over the years we're just seeing again that if you like you know, if you if, if you build it they will come and if you get your message out there enough they will come in there and that truly is the, the 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 Switzerland of platforms, it's neutral. Anybody can put their content on there. So I would say from the first one, if you're uh, an artist 
who's looking to get involved, if a brand like Vans has these offerings, take advantage of them. Um, I'll give you a quick one that uh, you, you might remember or may not. There's a young woman in Singapore, her name is Shai, and uh, she's been doing really cool things. Like this year, was it last year, losing track, but on National Day Parade, she was one of the performers. And four years ago, uh, with, the, with the push of her mother, she put her content up there, made it all the way to the top, it was 2002, and made it when she, she performed on a stage with five other acts that made their way up to the top, and she won. Because she won, she went to Guangzhou, and then she played on a stage with all the regional talents. And I think that gave her, as an artist, again, the confidence that she needed or wanted to take it outside of what we were able to provide and make a career out of it with the support of her, of her parents. So it's just this is one example of what we try to give. Then there's the, the other spectrum where we have top global talents like an Anderson Pack. And again, how we work with that artist. And it's not just, again, throwing money at him saying, okay, wave this flag, now you wear Vans. But truly engaging with that person and putting together story packs, product packs, working with that artist to kind of come up with fabrics and designs of what they want it to look like. And again, letting them roll out with their design. So I'd say to, those are the two extremes and there's opportunities within the middle, but again, like everything else, it's taking advantage of the opportunities that are there, not being afraid to ask. And again, like anybody, uh, and Janice can probably speak to this well, cause she represents a lot of artists is just having the courage to go up there and throw yourself out there and giving it a shot. And if you don't have that, it's going to be hard to make it anywhere uh, with any brand. So, so what you're saying is, I could I could just reach behind me, get my ukulele, and by the end of this session, I could be in a pair of size ten vans. As a matter of fact, I expect it. If I don't see <laughs> taking part in any music matters, stranger things have happened. Um, uh, so, so Janice, let's, I mean, Eli gave us the the, the, the word on the, on behalf of the brand. When when you're out talking to brands on behalf of the artists. What 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 do you need the artists to be able to do? I mean, what 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 again? What advice can you give artists who want to be able to work with brands? Um, whenever we work with brands, um, and out my experience working with Eli and Vance um, in 2019 is slightly different because that one is more. We were running a competition. We ran. We were running a talent search um, for the next best artist, um, for the next best undiscovered artist. But when you approach brands and try to pitch an artist to them, brands would always ask, how big is their following? Um, you know, how big is their social media um, numbers? How big is their fan base? Which markets are they resonating to? So I would say um, that is very important, especially for, for artists who wants to work with brands, um, building your fan base is is key um because brands would really want to get to, to to work with you and tap you for your audience um and in return if you get to work with a brand um you know you that would also benefit you in your career because the brand will then be able to put you on you know bigger platforms and different touch points that would you know in turn help grow your fan base So, so in terms of growing fan base, I mean, Rushit, this this is probably a good time to bring you in here. And um, uh, now, I, I mean, I know someone mentioned another another platform, but but if, if an artist was to work with YouTube, um, how how can how can YouTube help them grow this audience? And and this has been a right. theme that's come all the way through Music Matters and the the Academy is that artists. Uh, are that they are a a company that they're, they're you know the, the singer the lead singer is a CEO sometimes they get caught in this feeling that they've written a great song and that's it yeah. but that's half the job they then have to build their communities and you know so so, so what, what what advice can you give you know, from a YouTube perspective or, or from a digital platform perspective how can artists really be building out their communities so they can then go and sit down with with Eli and Danielle and, and, and sell themselves to them. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Jasper. But let me take a step back, right? So when we work with brands, uh, there's a few different objectives that they could be looking at, right? So there could be some brands who come in and want to be on BTS and Blackpink because you know that content's going to deliver as soon as it launches on the platform. 
and they're after awareness goals, and that's a great way to deliver fast reach. So when we're working with you know artists or labels like that, our conversations with brands is very different. The conversation that we have around emerging artists, you know, to Janice's point, it's increasingly important to create a presence on YouTube. Uh, the first question a lot of brands ask, and we try to tell them that you don't always have to work with a BTS or a Blackpink. You know, there's tons of great local artists out there. We're trying to, you know, work with brands in the region to integrate their brands within upcoming music videos. Uh, we work very closely with Universal Music to see which local artists are launching new content within the platform. But then there's the emerging artists, right? And it's it's a challenge sometimes to get a brand to look at that group of artists because, as Janice said, their first question is, what's their following? What's their social media? So on YouTube, we have lots of resources available. These are open resources available for artists on how they can create a presence on YouTube, how they can market their own content, and how they can boost it and push it out there. What we do see is that you know it's not just a uploading one piece of content and leaving it out there it's about being regular you know communicating with their fan base communicating with their audience constantly commenting to build that subscriber base uh using you know functions like youtube premieres to launch a new video when it comes in so there's tons of tools available for new artists as they upload content on youtube that they can get access to to build their own fan base so there are tools available and it's not just youtube i'm pretty sure most of the other platforms have you know, opportunities like that as well. Um, we just talked about what artists need to do to work with a brand. There's some great, great answers here about building fan bases, always be selling, get your messaging out and stuff. Um, uh, how important, um, now I'm gonna, let's go to Eli on this. Um, how important do you think is authenticity when a brand is working with, and it doesn't have to be about vans, right? Talking to you as a marketer, when a brand is working with an artist, is, is it about authenticity or is it about getting the message out to that fan base? That is so hard. Um, yes. Can I say that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> um, I guess to add a little perspective on that, I mean, think again, like the, the digital world has changed so much and kind of what we see, not just for music, but I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. So that might seem totally out of whack, but I think there's, there's like a red thread through it. So when we work with new partners selling product, we could work with a Shopee, we could work with Lazada, et cetera. You know, we would think that when we speak to these consumers through these channels that we're speaking to people who kind of, you know, resonate with the brand DNA. They, they care about the company, they care about what we do, et cetera. But the more that we really look into it, each platform has a very unique, different group of consumers. And we find more and more that what we think resonates with them in terms of, again, authenticity of, to what the brand, what we think we are, isn't necessarily what they see and what they are attracted to. So again, kind of going back to the idea of challenging ourselves is, is authenticity important or is it really just getting the message out there? At this point, it's a little bit a matter of both. It's the kind of self-check of how are we perceived by the people who are out there instead of just who we are and what's important to them and what resonates with them. And then once you can kind of at least get a temperature check for that one, like it'll never be 100% or even 70%. Um, but then the answer is yes, you need to broadcast it out. And then it comes down to, again, a brand like Vans, just to take my marketing hat off and my Vans hat back on, is knowing the kind of brand that we are and who we speak to, again, how can we utilize and really work with key partners, again, like Universal? maybe Google down the day, who knows, to take that really and make it just available to more eyes and more demographics. So we're capturing those new people who, again, hopefully will resonate with what we think or what we believe is we'll have that 10%, 20%, 30% of traction. They'll bring them in just long enough to sip the Kool-Aid, decide whether they want to sip it again or they want to go back to tap water. Um, so, so thank you. Um, Danielle, um, authenticity is it is it important um if someone's got a big enough fan base do you think that's that's enough um no i think sort of back in the day more traditional sponsorship um you know again before sort of social media and like really before the internet was so prevalent that's what you expected from sponsorship you can get cancelled so easily by the internet and by you know young people consumers 
um, they see right through it. Um, it can be challenging sometimes. Some of the products I work with, the brand, sorry, the product is potentially not sold in the West or in the States. So then when you're working with an artist, what you need to do with in terms of authenticity um, is look at the sort of the brand values and what the campaign is about and there needs to be a match there. Because if that individual or the artist hasn't grown up, you know, drinking a specific beer, there still needs to be a link that still feels authentic, like they need to still feel like a good ambassador for the campaign. Um, but yeah, I don't, like, I don't know how in this day and age you would just, I don't think anyone honestly would just pick an artist that had no fit at all with a brand that just had scale and it it just jars. Like I, I think most people are, would be smart enough not to do that now. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, can I just add something yeah. about uh, that subject, Jasper, of authenticity? Because I encounter it a lot in my job. Like, you know, everybody wants an authentic campaign, but I always crash my head thinking, how do you create an authentic campaign? Like, there's no, there's no blueprint for it. Like, like even if you, even if the artist and brand matching is is perfect, like, can you guarantee an authentic campaign? So. From my side, from the label side, what, what we tell our artists is if it doesn't feel right and if it doesn't, if you're not going to tell the truth in this deal, don't go ahead with it. Because, you know, more than authenticity, I, we want to encourage our artists to, you know, when they um, share a brand message or use their platform to speak of what the brand wants them to talk about, as long as it aligns with what is truthful to them, then that to us is a good partnership. But if, if we keep on going back to the word authentic, then I think we're just, it's hard It's hard to really come up with something that's truly authentic. It's, it's a very good point. I mean, a lot of the time when we work with artists uh, and brands, we, we say to the artists, whether they're musicians or YouTubers or TikTokers, whatever, who would you like to work with? Because once the artist likes the brand, you've got, Half, half the bat, half the battle won. Um, so, so I guess the question now, and, and I'm going to come back to you, Danielle. Is it, is it a, a marriage, or is it just a tactical? <laughs> it, it is a marriage. Um, you know, there's there's camp there's a campaign that we work on, which um, is in Asia and Eastern Europe. You know, markets not traditionally as served by um, label marketing. Sorry, <laughs> Janet. <laughs> As Western markets, so, you know, they're coming into it and the fee might not be as big as what they could get doing a deal with a Budweiser in America, but they're getting shed loads of marketing support in these markets, which they might not have even toured in before in some instances. Um, so when we, you know, we work with a brand, we work through this strategy, we've got the campaign together. We then create a selling deck, which we will take to the artist, which talks through the campaign, what the campaign's about. So the you know why is this going to be beneficial to that artist like what makes this cam campaign amazing what makes makes it a good marriage and um, i would say that like any marriage and um, the more stakeholders involved in a relationship the more difficult it gets just in terms of when you're coming to delivering a campaign because a lot of people have different opinions of what things should be or shouldn't be um but i feel like if the artist the artist team is clear up front on what's going to be like delivered in the campaign, if the agency and the brand understand that artist's brand, because they have their own brand, and you know, pick the right sort of directors, the right photographers, um, that campaign will be relatively seamless and painless because everyone understands what they're getting into, everyone understands the other's motivations, and then it can be a very happy marriage. Okay, so, so we've had a question from uh, Kelly Cook in Hong Kong who has asked, uh, an example, any good examples of brand and artist relationships that have worked and why? So, should we start with who wants to start? Rushit, do you want to start? Yeah. You're, you're yeah, in I my can, top left here. Yeah, I, I can start with an example. Look, uh, firstly, you know, it come let's just I also want to talk a little bit about what we've been on authenticity, right? Like, I think we work a lot with brands, and there could be certain categories, like if we're talking about a beauty video or a food video it's incredibly important to be authentic in that space. The way a lot of brands work with artists, what the authenticity comes in the association itself. So they need to identify why they're associating or partnering with a certain, with a certain artist. 
and why that fan base of that artist is important to the brand. Very often, the integration is very much a part of a music video or it's, you know, it's integrated within the messaging. So that's why all you got to be careful is it doesn't become, you know, you got to make sure it doesn't get cringeworthy and you just got to manage how that product placement comes into that entire video. Um, examples, a good example, we, we've actually, we worked with Castrol uh, a couple of years ago. So we have a lot of campaigns around the big festive moments like Tet in Vietnam, Ramadan in Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, and Castrol was one of the sponsors around a TED program, which we ran in Vietnam, which we run every year, which is one ongoing right now. Uh, and they partnered with uh, a rap artist who was the winner of Rap Viet, the first season of Rap Viet, that Yet Chat, if I, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and they integrated their message into the upcoming music video. And for Castrol, it was a great association because they needed to tap into a younger audience. It's difficult to do that as a lubricant brand. And to do that in a way it, that it's authentic. But fortunately, the way the video was planned, it was all around him biking around Vietnam. And there was a really good fit for the brand. And it played a role within that music video. Uh, it also worked very well from their perspective for their brand messaging. Uh, so I think that I would say that's a more tactical approach where you have an opportunity. You see something that you know is going to be very popular because the artist has certain popularity. Uh, and it's it's I think it's a good tactical way to approach it. There could be other partnerships which are more long term, right? Where and that's where things like YouTube Music Nights comes in, where we work with brands and say, why don't you create a property that you can then own for a long time? I mean, Coke has been incredibly successful with Coke Studio in Pakistan and India, and that that's an example that comes up really often with brands working well with music. Might not specifically be an artist, but it could be owning that entire vertical of music. So there are tons of different examples depending on what scale of the what the scale of the artist is. Janice, same question. What, what, what give us an example of a brand and artist relationship that has worked and why? Um, yeah, I, I, I spoke about the truth earlier, right? Um, versus authenticity, and, and when I say truth, I don't mean it in a very spiritual level. It's 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 very basic. Um, like the example that I want to share is this campaign that um, we did. Uh, with Jameson Whiskey, um, and it's it was a campaign that we ran during the COVID uh, during lockdown, and Jameson wanted to do um, a virtual performance series, um, and then we pitched Jesse Reyes um, to them, and a lot of people are asking like why Jesse Reyes, and by the way, I, I don't want to dishearten you know the the aspiring artists in the audience like not all brands. Own, um, work with global superstars. Like there's so many brands, even global brands out there who love supporting emerging artists. So there is an opportunity for everyone um, when it comes to working with brands. And Jesse Reyes and Jameson Whiskey is one example of it. Um, so going back to my point on the truth, like why Jesse Reyes um, and match her with Jameson Whiskey? Because Jessie Reyes, before you know, she she launched her career as a music artist. She was bartending, basically serving Jameson whiskey to her customers for the past ten years, um, and that you know made the partnership really good because then, you know, it it, it felt very it, it felt very close to her heart. Um, now having to come full circle from bartending, serving Jameson whiskey, to now performing. Um, on a Jameson stage, even though it was virtual. And that, I mean, so artist matching is, is one of the things that we do, but also how we treat partnerships like this. I mean, Jasper, you asked a good question earlier about are partnerships considered as a marriage? Like from, from our world in Universal Music Group for Brands, we kind of want to see it as we're actually matching people on a date. Because if you're on a date, it's more exciting. Um, and no brand really sticks with just one artist and one artist alone until death do them part. Like if you're on a date, you know, you always want to put your best foot forward. You always want to keep things fresh. Um, you know, so every element of that partnership is always going to be new and exciting for the artist, for the brand, and also for the fans. Um, so that that's my example from, from our end. So, so you're saying you don't have to be faithful? <laughs> Um, so, so same question to you, Danielle. Um, have you seen any 
examples of brand artist relationships that have really worked and, and why? Yeah, first of all, Janice, I love that date example. I'm going to steal that. That's awesome. Such a cool way to describe it. Um, firstly, I just want to say as well, the Pepsi Super Bowl spot with all those amazing super icons that like deserves them win. Um, but apart from that, I think it touches on what you were saying earlier, Jasper, about, you know, um, artists actually being a fan of the brand. So the Ed Sheeran Heinz Ketchup partnership, like Ed does not do partnerships, but the guy's got a Heinz Ketchup tattoo in his arm. So he then appeared in one of their commercials. I'm actually quite sad they didn't stretch it and get him to write the track for the advert. But, um, you know, there's a guy on, sorry, everyone's talking about TikTok. Yeah, the guy on TikTok that was skateboarding to fleet with Mac and um, to um, drinking Ocean Spray, like he ended up getting endorsed by Ocean Spray properly. Like if you love a brand and you you genuinely use that brand, like especially if you're an up and coming artist, like post content about it. Like some if it takes off, someone from the brand sees it, they might then end up working with you. So yeah, authentic, back to the authenticity and fit. It's key. It's, it's absolutely key. E Eli, saying finally to you the same, the same question. Where, where have you seen it, it working? And by the way, I'm being attacked by a cat at the moment. So if I suddenly cut out, it means that her, his paws have just logged me out of my computer. Um, sure. Eli, yeah. When, when does it work? When does it work? I think there's, again, it goes back to the kind of brand and what, what they're looking for. What, what's, what's considered success? Um, you know, I can, I, I'll just use us as an example, us being Vans. Um, I would say that to, this, to date right now, the partnership with Anderson Pack has been, has been successful for two reasons. One, again, it's with the brands behind creative expression and, 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 and inspiring and building creative expression with our community. And to have an artist who is as creative as Anderson is, and to give them even further that kind of the power of end, right? And we want you to be involved with us in creating product. The artist themselves is a little bit more personally invested into the partnership because you're not looking at it as just that. They're that and a bag of chips. It's a really bad cliche, but you know where I'm going with this. So I think because of that, you really you build a partnership with that individual, and that leads to a more qualitative delivery. And it may not be in terms of we're selling X amount more product, but again, almost going back to skateboarding as an example. It was never about going out and creating a skate shoe. It was about supporting the skaters at the time back in the 60s who came to the Van Doren saying, will you do this with us? And them saying, yes. And by that partnership, they gave us permission to play in that sphere. And that still holds true to these days by really having a relationship with these artists and having that unique relationship, they give us permission to play in that field. Without them and that without that trust and with a relationship, there's there's nothing symbiotic to it. So I'd say on the top end, that would be a good example for us. On the bottom end, or the stuff that's more organic, there are probably names and individuals that nobody has ever heard of, but internally we would look at these individuals over the past bunch of years saying, because of them, we were able to build this kind of community in this country, in this demographic. You know, by this person uh, winning in Singapore in 2017, the Singapore version of Musicians Wanted, and they got a check for X amount of dollars. And this is a true story. That guy and his wife went out, put the money into a venue, and opened up a live music venue that then was, again, host to hundreds of shows for the next couple of years. And they kept that Musicians Wanted check behind the stage as, again, something that enabled them to create it going. So, I mean, I could sit here for 20 minutes and give you examples of what worked. I could give you one example of what didn't work. Great. That was going to be my, my next question. What, when, does it, when does it not work and what are the rookie errors? So this goes back to being authentic. And um, it's a personal, personal example before my time with Vans. Uh, when I was 19, I moved to China. And my first job was uh, at a Kunming as the Coors Light band with three other dudes, Italian, a British guy, and a local guy. And for three years, we toured around China in some of the sketchiest cities and towns and bars that you've ever seen as the Coors Light brand. And it didn't work. I don't think they sold any more beers. Matter of fact, if I was them, I would have fired us the first year because we probably sold less beer. Uh, and I think what it came down to was the authentic tie-in where the, the individual that saw us were like, oh my Lord, four people, four you know, Caucasians who are from America. And actually only one of us was, that was me. 
aggressively made it up, they can help us peddle this American beer in these tier two and three cities. It just didn't work. It was an idea that was way out there. They kept paying us though. Well, I'll say thank you for it. But again, did, if, if I was Coors Light at this point in my life and my career going back, I would have said that was a terrible idea. Let's use it as a case study. Do not do that. Let's find something more authentic and bring it out to the market. Sure. And, and so, so, so what do you think the, the rookie errors that artists can make when trying to work with brands? Know why you want to work with that brand and be ready to kind of back it up. Because again, there's a lot of artists out there. And there really needs to be from the person that you're speaking with, that person wants to, I hate to say this, they want to be sold to. Why do you want to work with us? And again, for Vans, it could be the story of what their first pair of Vans were, their first trip to Warp Tour, whatever engaged them to say, all right, I think we can work together. But it was just a matter of really that first pitch of, I've got 5 million fans on my Instagram page. That could be a hook in, but it could also be a huge red flag because you're saying the same thing to everybody else. Where's the, where's the interest? Where's the understanding? I thought we were on a date here. <laughs> like, let's go on a second date. Well, you, you do, you do need to, to like each other on a date, right? So, 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 so Danielle, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back in reverse order. What, 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 what rookie errors have you seen artists making when trying to work with brands? <clears throat> I think, um, as we've talked about sponsorship has evolved to partnership with our dating scene. Um, I think a lot of the pitfalls happened over this sort of transition period. I'm not going to name and shame any bands, but there are some classic like case studies that get shown on like, what not to do. And it harks back to just, is this really awkward? Does this make sense? Um, and then also just behind the scenes, you know, if both sides don't understand what they're going into or what to expect that can leave quite bad feelings because then the campaign's really difficult to see through. And, you know, you then like, you never want to work with that artist again. Um, and the brand sort of feels the same way. So like reputation is really important, but on the, on the, you know, the brand and agency side, it is also important to know that artists aren't, you know, they're not actors, music artists aren't actors, you know, they're not going to be on camera. They'll be super awkward like me on camera. Um, so it's just sort of, expectations of what to get from from artists like going into it to make sure that it ends you know in a positive way for both sides janice um from my side the i'll, I'll give examples from on both the artist and and the brand side that i feel are being done like like where it goes wrong on each side from the artist side it's like what daniel said it's it's setting the wrong expectations up front um that's always that is very tricky because then it just it could easily go downhill from there um and also a lot of artists um and this is what i also remind um you know our artists whenever we secure deals with them uh for them with brands is that you need to respect the deal as both a partnership with a brand and also as a transaction, like you have a contract with the brand, you have agreed on everything that you said you would deliver. So turn up for each of those things uh, and make sure you do it 100% with a smile on your face. Um, because some artists, you know, are just happy to, um, you know, put that in their list of, yay, I was able to work with this brand. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done and, and, and expectations that has to be fulfilled. So um that's that's what i would always remind um artists and then on the brand side i think it goes wrong when they don't treat the artist as human beings you know they 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 ask too many things they 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 forget that the artist is also a person with a family with friends who need downtime who has to, who needs to have their time off who also, you know, by 6 p.m. needs to go home and go back to their family or have beer with their friends. But sometimes the brands demand too much as if they, when the artist signs the contract with them, the artist has already sold their soul to the brand, but that's not the case. So it, 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 the respect actually goes both ways. Um, so from, from the artist side, really, it's, it's turn up and deliver everything that you promised to deliver. And from the brand side, um, recognize the artist as, as, as a human being. Fantastic. And Ru Rusha, finally with you. 
Yeah, um, uh, look, I mean, uh, it's pretty similar to what Janice said. I think some of the, I won't name and shame, but I've definitely seen a lot of artists just be too desperate to close the deal. Uh, and, you know, when, you want, when you're at that negotiation table, there are tons of deal makers in the middle, right? At the end of the day, the artist needs to put their foot down on what they can and cannot do. Uh, and I think sometimes it's it's a tough decision, but sometimes don't be too eager to close the deal because either you'll you'll end up like working your ass off, or you will end up you know losing your fan base because you won't be authentic to your fan base if you're too loud in your branding and in your you know associations and sponsorships. Brilliant. So so look, I'm being shouted at, screamed at by the production team in all sorts of different places because uh, we've we've run over time. Um, this has been fascinating listening to all of you talking. Uh, we are going to take you into uh, the meet and greet area next. Where So if anyone watching, you just go into Bizabo, you click on the session, and you can come and meet our four wonderful speakers and ask them more questions. Um, but but I've, I've written quite a lot of notes here. We were talking about engaging. We were talking about matchmaking. There's a lot of things about dating and relationships and marriage here. Um, we talked about... Uh, as an artist, you have to build your fan base. You have to have scale, really, to be able to work with a brand or, or usually to work with a brand. Reach matters. Um, always this, 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 also this, this concept of always be selling. Don't ever give up selling if you're an artist. We talked a lot about authenticity and how important that is. And, and it's not selling out if you're giving an authentic message. But tell the truth. Um, there are opportunities for everyone. So it, it's not just the BTSs and Justin Bieber's. It's also the, the, the emerging artists as well have, have opportunities to work with brands. Um, we talked about it being a date, but the date has to work. And interestingly, you can have lots of dates as well. So, uh, you know, and that goes for both sides as well. So, so you know, you, I think you have to be uh, uh, a, a little, you know, you have to be responsible there. Um and we talked about managing expectations. So it's a partnership and a transaction. Bands are human. Brands need to understand that. And so if there's a deal in place, then understand what each of you are giving. So with that, I'm going to say a very, very, very big thank you. Oh, by the way, apologies again for our little internet uh, issue earlier on. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, we have no idea what happened, but it just died. Um, but with that, thank you so much. We got the client, the agency, the digital platform, the label. So thank you to Eli. Thank you to Danielle. Thank you to Janice. And thank you to Rushit. Um, we'll see you backstage in a minute.